This is TechSnap, episode 371. Welcome to TechSnap, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We recorded this episode on June 7th. 2018. It's brought to you by our three great sponsors, IX Systems, Ting, and Digital Ocean. I'll tell you about those sponsors as this show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining me every single week is our host, the admin, the presenter, and the engineer. It's Mr. Payne, Mr. Wes Payne. Hello, Wes. Hello, Chris. It's super great to be connected with you, Wes, from Austin, Texas. That's our first tech snap ever from Austin, Texas. And we're warming things up this week with a story that's a little out there. What's one of the strangest places you could think of putting a data center? Well, how about underwater? It's an idea that Microsoft has been toying around with since 2015 when it sunk a tiny little data center for five months. Well, this week, news is coming out about a much larger data center that could be under the ocean for as long as five years. Picture this, a large white cylinder, obviously with a giant Microsoft logo emblazoned on the side, filled to the brim with computers sitting on the seafloor. How do you make all that work? Well, an undersea cable brings the data center power and takes all the data that, you know, you're storing there back to the shore and up to the wider internet. One of the problems with this, it's very in- innovative. You can't repair things, right? There's, this is meant to be sealed, dropped on the seafloor, and sort of like, it's it's done until the whole thing is lifted back up at the end of its lifespan. Yeah, and the theory is that the cost of cooling the computers could be cut way down by placing them underwater. And there's also the fact that there's no people in these huge cylinders, so they can take all of the oxygen out which is what causes most of the water vapor issues. And since there's no water vapor in atmosphere, it reduces corrosion, which helps extend the life of the machines. Yeah, kind of on the surface, it seems like it might be more complicated or more difficult, and certainly to start it is. But really, I think this is an exercise in simplification and eliminating extra variables. Like all those humans, we've talked about stories, you know, people unplugging power cables, tripping over stuff in the data center. That can't really happen here. This is a like a multi-company project, uh, including companies out of France and uh, companies out of the U.S. and obviously Microsoft themselves and the European Marine Energy Center as well all came together to build something like this as an experiment. But the long term vision would be like five or so of these cylinders that could be placed right off the coast of a city that needed additional infrastructure all of a sudden, maybe offshore for 90 days which is just an insane concept. If you wanted to build a data center just for 90 days on land, you couldn't do it. But they could drop these things down, get them connected, and provide emergency infrastructure or even long-term infrastructure, possibly. Right. If you can just get that process refined where, you know, you just sort of pack these things up, get them ready, and then as you have time, drop them in the ocean, connect them up. That's, that's kind of great. Now, where is this happening? It's happening in Orkney, or the Orkney Islands, which is an archipelago in the northern islands of Scotland. Some residents have been a little curious, like, what are the environmental effects? Are there risks to doing this that we don't have on land? Microsoft's Ben Cutler insists the warming effect will be minimal. The water just just sort of moves downstream, and it, it would only get a few thousands of a degree warmer at most. So the overall environmental impact of this Orkney data center, it, it should be positive. Yeah, the other reason they say that they're trying it out there is because they have a surplus of natural renewable power. And so they're going to power this entire data center using renewable power, which is a pretty neat test as well, because they're trying to also evaluate the environmental impacts of different data centers. And so this is one way to say we may have solved a cooling issue. We may have also solved the problem of power, at least in this circumstance. It's a pretty cool idea. And we'll have a link in the show notes, techsnap.systems slash 371. Honestly, it's worth it just for the pictures. This project is interesting for really a whole variety of reasons. But the part I'm interested in the most is is the sustainability angle. Because if you think about it, a lot has changed in the last 20 years in tech. I mean, isn't that always true? But Suddenly we have all these data centers, and yes, we can run them now with our current expenditures, but they're expensive, and we haven't really figured out, like, how long are these going to last? We don't really know as a society how to keep data intact for 50, 100, 200 years, and then especially not doing so while trying to reduce carbon footprints, while trying to take care of the environment. So props to Microsoft for really trying to put in some good work here. 
The details always matter, and that's why your TextNet program loves to cover them. So let's go through a batch of stories where maybe we can grok a few details. First up, the recent hack of ticket distribution website TicketFly, which exposed more than 26 million email addresses, along with home addresses, phone numbers, and first and last names. All this has been reported by Have I Been Pwned, one of the TextNet program's favorite notification services. The breach was first reported last week by Motherboard, which reported that the breach was carried out by a hacker who had first offered to provide TicketFly officials with details of the underlying vulnerability in exchange for one Bitcoin, at the time worth approximately 7500 US dollars. When the officials at TicketFly didn't respond, the hackers then defaced the site and published the user data online. Oh boy. That's embarrassing. No kidding. And I think that, I mean, that there's many things to take away from this, but right there, when you have, obviously this, obviously these parties were not super responsible and extorting websites for money is, it's just not acceptable, right? It's not ethical. It's, it's not acceptable in today's world, but it is important that you take those things seriously and do an immediate security audit. If you're not going to pay, if you're not going to, you know, engage with them directly, fine, but take your security seriously and go do an audit. Now, the TicketFly um, officials, as they're called in this article, had a blog post where they talked about bringing the website back online, and they used interesting language. They say, we've built a secure, non-WordPress-based website solution with the existing domain. Hmm. See, that that right there, I know we harp on this a lot, but WordPress is convenient, and that puts it at the wrong end of secure almost all of the time. Now, if you have yeah. dedicated on-call people, if you have professionals managing your WordPress, it can be it can be done correctly, right? And they and the WordPress community, to their credit, has done a much better job of automatic updates, handling security problems quickly. But there's still just a lot of security issues, and it's a big, complex, moving ecosystem. If you can do something simpler with static websites, with with APIs that have good authentication that are just less featureful and therefore have less attack surface, it's really worth it to do so and avoid bad press like this. It's just simple physics of websites, really. It's just it comes down to the law of complexity, and you know, as a result, they had 27 million accounts accessed. Now, it's just information. Like, you know, your name, your address, your email address, and your phone number, but uh, no credit card information. And their passwords supposedly weren't touched either. But still, 27 million personal identifiable records is pretty significant. And it sounds like potentially because of some WordPress flaw, perhaps they just hadn't updated. It's pretty bad. It really is. And and certainly you get a lot of leverage from using these, these you know, big open source community tools. But there are risks associated with that. And, you know, the more popular, the larger target that you've been. We've talked about this for years with popular operating systems like Windows. When a lot of people use it, that just means a lot of those people will have insecure setups. And uh, therefore, you got you to gotta not be the least insecure, right? It's, you got to be faster than the slowest person in your party, as they say. Yeah, not only is it a large attack surface, but it's a well-known attack surface. And you make a good point. It's not just a WordPress issue. For an example... Drupal also is affected by this same issue. More than 115,000 websites, some run by major universities, government organizations, and media companies, have remained wide open to take over because of a well-known vulnerability where there's even example code out there, and they just haven't patched. Infected web pages include those belonging to the University of Southern California, Computer World's Brazil site, and the Arkansas Judiciary's Courts and Community Initiative, which were causing visitors' computers to run resource-intensive code that mines cryptocurrency, because of course it does. Right? Surprise, surprise, it's cryptocurrency. Yeah, and even some of these are doing like massive downloads to people's computers and making them just chug away at uh, some coin. It's, it's so what they all do these days. Now, if you're not familiar... Drupal is an open source content management system and probably the most popular version of that software. It, it, it really is quite useful when you're running a big website, especially if you're not necessarily an expert in website design. It can be difficult to manage all the different resources and assets that you need to, to make a modern website. But of course, that same convenience and functionality means that you can make dumb mistakes. And these are just another example. The lack of patching here and all the site takeovers that that then made possible come after Drupal maintainers released an update in March that would have fixed all this. And instead, without patching, it let hackers remotely execute code 
of their choice. Now, this vulnerability was more severe than most, and partly because it was just so easy to exploit. Therefore, researchers dubbed it Drupalgeddon 2, which is a throwback, if if you don't recall, back to 2014, which was the first Drupalgeddon, another mass exploit vulnerability that within hours was patched, but of course didn't get widely patched, and therefore thousands of sites were breached. So not only were the patches released in March, but the vulnerability was so similar to one in 2014 that example code was released when they announced the vulnerability. So exploit code was essentially available on day one. Wow. See, in, in that world, like in the 2018 world of, of you have example code where things are just so easy to exploit, you need ways to, to automatically patch. You need ways to get alerts for this. And I think that in many ways is, is somewhat of an unsolved problem, especially like we, we see here some of the, the websites. These are not big corporations, right? These are not people that like their, their, all their revenue, all their focus is on their website. Their website is kind of a component of what they do. So, you know, they might have a couple members of staff who do it, but a lot of their job ends up just being, you know, adding updates, adding a new blog entry, adding some new features to the website here and there. It's not a huge component of their workflow. So not only do they have to make sure that they have mechanisms in place to get notified, they also have to be swift enough and competent enough managing the software that they can apply patches with confidence that they won't bring down their system. That's not an easy problem. So all that being said, both WordPress and the Drupal project are are really getting patches out as fast as what seems to be humanly possible, and they really seem to be committed to fixing these issues. But of course, no matter how hard you try, sometimes things just go wrong and something bad happens. That's why next we're turning over to opensource.com, where security researcher Gary Smith has an excellent article about breach detection and how you can use common Linux utilities to do some file system forensics. It really all starts with getting that disk image. Once you've got the disk image of the affected system in hand, you need a platform to analyze it. And and one of those that's available is the SANS SIFT workstation distribution. SIFT, or S-I-F-T, is a group of free and open source incident response and forensic tools designed to perform detailed digital forensic examinations in a variety of settings. SIFT has a huge array of forensic tools, And if it doesn't have a tool that you want, you can install one without very much difficulty because it's really just an Ubuntu-based distribution. So think think about this as like the Kali Linux, uh, but instead of, you know, trying to breach into systems, responding to breaches. Once you're up and running there, you'll probably be curious about just what's inside that disk image. Now, of course, there's tons of ways to do this, things like FDisk, GDisk, but something Gary's highlighted is the MMLS utility. That was something I had never used before, so I was kind of curious. And and basically, it's just a it's just a handy utility to display the partition layout of different volumes. And that's just super valuable to get a layout of the land. But what's also important is sort of the output that it uses, so that way you can get a real in depth look at the disk. Yeah, exactly. And and one thing I'm noting here about some of the utilities Gary is is highlighting are the wide use, the generality of those things. When you're investigating a specific system, sure, like you might have tools to investigate an ext4 system, but those probably only work on that file system or that partition layout or, you know, any sort of specifics there. And what you really want, especially when you're dealing with an unknown system that you've captured or been sent by a client, you need something that's general that understands a huge, a huge array of different types of system configurations. So after you've got, you know, where does the partition start? What partitions do I have? What's actually on this disk? Next up, you go one layer higher, and you want to know about the file systems. And for that, turn to FSStat, which displays the details associated with a file system. It has a support for a ton of different file systems. So whether this ends up being, you know, a, a weird file system that you like F2FS, or a Windows file system, or just a run-of-the-mill Linux file system, FSStat is there, and it's got the details you need. Yeah, like the last time any data was ever written to the file system, whether the file system was cleanly unmounted, and where the file system was mounted on the host system that it was originally connected to. That is good information. Another thing to underscore here that maybe we glossed over is just that you really do want to be working with an image of the system. If at all possible, you know, you shut the system down, get an image. This is especially easy if you're already using something like virtualization. That way you have a clean copy that you can manipulate, that you can work with without having to worry that you're disturbing evidence or messing anything up for future analysis. And once you've got that, then... Next up, you're going to need to mount those partitions, start looking at what's actually happening on that system. 
And of course, you're doing things like you're mounting this image as a read only. You could be working from a copy. There's lots of good reasons, like Wes just pointed out, to use an image to do this. And one of them is that way you can guarantee you don't alter the original data that you're investigating. Once you've got your system set up, you're ready to investigate in further detail. It's all mounted up. You're maybe you're chirruted into there. You're poking around. You probably want to create a timeline. And, and in the industry, this is often referred to as a super timeline, which is kind of a fun phrase. A popular tool for creating these things is logged to timeline, but there's a new version of it called Plosso, which is a Python based rewrite of the Perl based log to timeline tool. What is a super timeline, you're asking? Okay, yeah, well, that's fair, because it's kind of a weird phrase. Basically, a super timeline is is a method of extracting and then aggregating a huge number of different timestamps from a computer. So all sorts of things a user could do, and then putting those in one place that you can view them and get one over overarching view of exactly what's been happening. So if you, if you go check out Plasso's GitHub page, you can see the crazy number of things it supports, stuff like the Apple system log, Android usage history, Ben code files, Chrome disk cache, cups printing, the Firefox cache, Mac OS application firewall, NTFS, OpenXML, PCAP files, Safari binary cookies, SE Linux audit logs. So all these things, right? There's, there's a lot of those and poking through those by hand. Yes, useful. Yes, you might have to do that. But if you can get some tooling that can just suck all that data out, output one big file that you can then go poke through, that is incredibly useful. Not only that, but then you can run it through some really nice tools, even even if it's just tossed in a spreadsheet or thrown a MySQL database, but maybe you could even go as far as run it through Elasticsearch or more. Like you can really get some powerful data then. Right. Yeah, exactly. A spreadsheet program is good enough to start. You know, you can sort of like view, sort, get your pivot table action on, but you really probably want to stick it in a real database or or something that's that's already used to analyze large amounts of data because probably it is going to be a large amount of data. In particular, Elasticsearch has been common. It's not always uh, that easy to get set up. It's not always that easy for beginners to work with, but if you're already familiar with it, if you're already using it, it is powerful. And one of the big features it has is an integration with Kibana, which is a which is a sister project which specializes in visualizing and analyzing data. Honestly, this is where the author on the opensource.com post takes it to the next level. We will have it linked in the show notes. He's able to visualize actions on the system using these tools like installing software, uh, moving around the directory, updating passwords. He can visualize them and even bar graph them. It's remarkable. Yeah, this article is definitely worth giving a giving a long read to. We're just skimming over some of the some of the interesting details, but there's a lot in there. He also highlights some, you know, like an actual case study that he's been working through, which has some interesting details of its own. Yeah, using the tools that we talk about here, he was able to identify a user that logged into the system and did some odd activity, like install a mar- martial arts program on the system, which then turned out to actually be a rootkit. And he tracked that down by visualizing the timeline of the actions on the system. Right, yeah, you can use Kibana's search capability to find other instance of just like specific words. And then once you've aggregated all that data, you can search in, you know, all the log files and all the web browsing history. So you can see things like, oh, yep, there he searched for it. Oh, yep, there it's downloaded. Oh, there he ran it. You can really get a history that ties those things together. Another interesting technique Gary uses here is Elasticsearch and Kibana are obviously a powerful, powerful toolkit that he's, he's leveraging here to investigate. But he also does something that I thought might strike some of our users as handy. He imported all the bash command histories into a table in a MySQL database. So if you're all familiar with SQL, if you're all familiar with bash, once those histories are loaded, you can just easily display and query through them with normal SQL syntax. In this case, the user he's investigating does some pretty odd things. The user John first created the John N, so an extra N on the username account. He deleted it, created it again, copied bin true to bin false, Gave passwords to the whoopsie and light DM accounts, copied bin bash to bin false, edited the password and group files, moved the user's home directory from John N to dot John N, therefore hiding it, changed the password file using said, after, of course, first looking up how to use said, because obviously no one knows, and then finally installing that weirdly named rootkit. <laughs> no one knows. Really what I liked about this about this breakdown was just there's a surprising amount of leverage you can get with common tools. 
yes, it, it is, you know, you do have to know how to use them. And it does require some of that old Unix philosophy, piping things, tying different systems together. But there's a lot of advantages to that. You don't have to learn one big monolithic application. Instead, you can leverage some tools that you might already be using. You might be using Elasticsearch just for regular full, sex, full text search. You're probably already using a SQL database of some kind somewhere if you're involved with technology at all. And what inspired me about this was just, if you'll do a little bit and then get some guidance from some experts who are already doing it, like Gary, you can learn a lot. And whether that helps you in a professional context or just helps you feel more secure about auditing the systems that you maintain, it's super valuable. The zip slip vulnerability is something you'll be hearing a lot more about because it affects the core of a lot of software that we all use. So break it down for us, Mr. Payne. Zip slip is a widespread arbitrary file overwrite vulnerability, which can result in many cases in remote command execution. Uh oh. <laughs> it was discovered and disclosed by the sneak security team ahead of a public disclosure on the 5th of June. It affects thousands of projects, including projects from HP, Amazon, Apache, and many more. It's also found in many different language ecosystems, including JavaScript, Ruby, .NET, Go, and especially Java. The vulnerability in this case is exploited using a specifically crafted archive that holds directory traversal file names. Basically something like dot dot slash 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 and then the file name. And don't let the name fool you. It's not just zips. It also can affect numerous other archive formats like RAR, 7-zip, uh, APK, and TAR as well. To dive a little deeper, zip slip is a form of directory traversal that can be exploited by extracting files from an archive. The premise here is that an attacker can gain access to parts of the file system outside of the target folder in which they reside. So normally, you know, someone someone ships you a tar GZ, you extract it, you expect that that's going to at worst extract a bunch of garbage into your present working directory, or ideally into a subdir that you've created or that was embedded within the archive, not extract files on arbitrary locations all over your file system. And of course, you know, if, if these were just normal files, text files, maybe that wouldn't matter. But a lot of these archive formats support having the execute bit set, and that means you can override executable files with other executable files and then either invoke them directly or you just wait for the system or the user to call them, and then you've got remote command execution. Especially if you know that you know there's some executable that you can overwrite that is called in a cron job or sourced from like a bash RC, boom, it's over. And this gets triggered just by simply extracting the archive? Yeah, exactly. Really, there's kind of two parts that are required to exploit this vulnerability. The first is a malicious, specially crafted archive. And it's worth pointing out here that most of the time, you know, most traditional archiving tools, things that you and I are using to create these art archives, they're not going to let you create these malicious files. But... The archive formats aren't that complicated. So if you roll your own code, if you use some sort of some special tools that exist, or, you know, tools for really modifying the headers and the data structures involved, it's not very difficult to create them. Secondly, you need extraction code that does not perform validation checking. They've got some good examples up on their websites. So you could have a zip file that has two files contained within it, a, a good.sh, and then also an evil.sh, but within the zip file, <laughs> good, good.sh is just good.sh, but evil.sh, its actual file name within the archive is dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash and so on until finally being slash temp slash evil.sh. This takes advantage of the fact that on many Unix systems, if you attempt to, you know, go up a level from the root directory, you just find yourself in the root directory. There's nothing above the root directory. So, Malicious actors can put as many up traversals as they want, and that can make sure that they, you know, as long as you have enough, most people don't have more than, let's say, like 10 levels deep of folders at any one place in their tree. So especially where a user might actually work or a program will store temporary data. So it's pretty easy to then have a path to the root. And so you can overwrite at a specific location, dump stuff right on the root itself, whatever you need. They've got some good examples, primarily in Java, because Java in particular lacks a really commonly embraced library for high-level handling of zip files. Um, it does have 
good low level support. And that means you can do things like with a zip file, you can just get all the entries, you can get the individual file data streams. And it's not that complicated for users to just roll their own, you know, it's like seven lines of code to extract a bunch of zip files. But that seven lines does not often include any sort of checking for correct path names. So that's why this vulnerability strikes Java in particular. Ah, uh, okay. They've got some good examples, right? So you basically do something like, all right, we've got your zip file. You can call get entries on that. And that just lists everything that's contained within there. And then so you loop over all those entries. For each one, you then you make a new file. And that is wherever, you know, you make a new file with the path concatenated between your destination dir, so wherever you're trying to put it. And then you call get name. And that goes and looks up within the archive the name of the file. But that concatenation... There's no validation. There's nothing that says, hey, is this actually within our destination target? And that's where the vulnerability strikes. It's pretty simple and in some ways, you know, almost too simple. And it's that's why it's so easy to overlook and why so many libraries have this problem. Geez, it sounds like this could be pretty potentially widespread. So you got me a little worried. How do I tell if software I'm using is vulnerable at this point? Good question. You were vulnerable if you were either using a library which contains the zip slip vulnerability or your project directly contains vulnerable code, which is extracting files from an archive without doing any kind of directory traversal validation. Sneak is maintaining a GitHub repository listing all projects that they've found to be vulnerable. And they've already done a bunch of responsible disclosure, including fixed dates and versions. So we'll have that linked in the show notes. You can go check that out. It's also open to contributions. So if you find extra code, maybe you're the maintainer of an open source project that you notice is vulnerable to this, and please do go check let them know, submit a pull request, you can get that up there too, so that users can find can find all this information in one place. Just one week has gone by since we talked about VPN filter last week, and we've already got an update for you. I'd say it looks like things are much more complicated than we initially thought, Wes. Yeah, nothing ever seems to get simpler or easier, does it? Definitely not, especially when it comes to state-sponsored malware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cisco's Talos team has been conducting additional research, really just ongoing since they first reported this, and they've determined that additional devices are also being targeted by these actors, including some from vendors that are new. These new vendors are Asus, D-Link, Huawei, Ubiquiti, Upvel, and ZTE. There's also just new devices from existing vendors like Linksys, Microtech, Netgear, and TP-Link. They do note, of course, that no Cisco network devices appear to be affected. They've also discovered some new Stage 3 modules that inject malicious content into web traffic as it passes through the network device. When they first reported, they didn't have a ton of information about the Stage 3 modules. We we mostly talked about the Stage 1 and 2 modules, Stage 1 being the, in particular, the, the most dangerous one because it was persistent. This new module allows the actor to deliver exploits to endpoints via a man in the middle capability because they can just intercept network traffic and inject malicious code into it without the user being aware at all. Most home users aren't paying attention to their router, right? That's why this is such a big deal. And once it can inject content into whatever pages that you're visiting, especially if they, you know, they're not using SSL, well, there you go. You're pwned. Right. Speaking of HTTP and HTTPS traffic, one of the things it does very cleverly is if it detects the user typed in HTTPS to go to a website, say google.com, it replaces that HTTPS with a good old HTTP. Right. And this is possible because it is your gateway. So you've never even managed to establish a connection. Google doesn't know that you want to have all the protections of SSL. And then suddenly you're specifically requesting old style HTTP, and that makes you vulnerable. This module named Essler first configures the infected device's IP tables to redirect all traffic that's destined to port 80 to its own local service listening on port 8888. So that means any outgoing web requests on port 80 are now intercepted and then inspected and manipulated before being sent to the actual service. And keep in mind, we're not talking about desktops here. We're talking about edge devices like routers and home devices and small business devices. So that would be all of the HTTP traffic on the network. Go check out the show notes for a bunch more details, including the full list of affected devices, at, at least as best known at the present time by the researchers. I think really what is underscored here is VPN filter is complicated, widespread, and it's going to continue to evolve. As we talked about last week in TechSnap 370, 
stage one is persistent. And while the FBI has intervened and sort of shut things down for the moment, all it takes is another malicious packet to routers that are still infected for this whole thing to begin again. ixsystems.com slash techsnap. That's where you go to learn more about IX Systems, a company that could build solutions driven by open source. I've been talking more and more about different use cases and workloads you can use IX hardware for. And of course, it's endless. They'll custom build a solution for you with their white glove approach. But let's talk about backup for a moment. That's something that's on our mind. And IX Systems has solutions that help protect your data as it grows. And we all know that your data needs get more and more demanding and IX Systems can help you build a system that will scale to your growth but not break the pocketbook. You can protect your enterprise storage environment and save time and money with a TrueNAS Unified Storage Array with built-in data security from OpenZFS. The TrueNAS Unified Storage Array has industry standard built-in data encryption that's compliant with HIPAA, PCI, and of course, now the GDPR. The enterprise version of FreeNAS, it's TrueNAS, the world's number one software-defined storage operating system. You can achieve better backup integrity through its built-in self-healing bit rot mitigation with unlimited instant snapshots, replication, and encryption. And of course, whenever you need it, their award-winning white glove US-based support. ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Support the show and grab a white paper to learn more about IX and maybe even grease the wheels up the chain in your business. ixsystems.com slash techsnap. And TechSnap is also made possible by do.co slash snap. Digital ocean infrastructure when you need it as fast as you can possibly imagine with data centers all over the world. Everything is SSD based. And when you go to do.co slash snap, you will get a $100 credit. Once you apply that with a new account, you get 60 days to try DigitalOcean. Simple and scalable. You can deploy a system that's custom built, mix and match resources as you need it, or deploy my favorite system with four gigabytes of RAM, two CPUs, 80 gigabytes of built-in SSD, and three terabytes of transfer. It's just three cents an hour. And when you go to do.co slash snap, you get that $100 credit. You can make a lot of machines. You can even try something out, maybe test out a new project idea that you've had and put something in production. They have monitoring and alerting so you can keep an eye on things, DNS management that's super easy and integrated, and of course, data centers all over the world with 40 gigabit connections coming into the hypervisors themselves. And their cloud firewalls take care of all of the traffic you don't want at the network edge instead of letting it hit your device. Plus, they have tons of great documentation to help you take advantage of DigitalOcean. Just a couple of days ago, they posted a brand new open VPN setup guide for getting it going on the latest version of Ubuntu. You can find so much good documentation on DigitalOcean's site. You can deploy an entire application stack like GitLab, the entire stack, with one click, or you can build it yourself and follow their guides if you ever need help. Just start by going to do.co slash snap. Also, thank you to Ting, techsnap.ting.com. That's where you go to take $25 off a device or get $25 in service credit for something that's smarter than unlimited. It's Ting. When you use less, you pay less. The average Ting bill is $23 per phone per month. It's so simple and easy. I can explain it in just seconds. It's $6 a month for your line and then your usage, your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes. Whatever you use, that's what you pay. techsnap.ting.com. Nationwide coverage, which I have been testing very extensively on this road trip and that's how i'm talking to you guys right now they have no contracts no early termination fees you just pay for what you use you can use their control panel to make sure everything's copacetic and exactly what you expect disable individual services and i'm gonna recommend a phone for you the moto g6 ting actually has a review up on their blog right now when you go to techsnap.ting.com you can buy this high-end unlocked android device for $224 because you get that $25 discount. It's a great value phone with a 3000 milliamp battery, turbo charge, great screen, and it supports Moto Mods. They have a full review up on their blog. I love the Ting approach. You can bring your own device or grab one from them. They don't get in the way. They have no experience agenda that they want to push down to your device. They just let you use your phone however you want and you just pay for what you use. Techsnap.ting.com. Thanks for going to techsnap.systems slash contact to throw us your question or to send us your war story. We've got a couple of hard ones this week. Wes, kick us off with our first email. All right. Well, you know that when you're in an office, your email, that's precious. There are details that you don't really want just anyone having. So that's the context for our first bit of feedback today. 
Long story short, Mike Corker has added a domain admin account that only he has access to as a delegate with full ownership on my exchange account. After some more digging, I found that the same access is on every IT staff account, all managers and all senior level staff. It does not exist on any regular employee account outside the IT department. Two things here tip me off to him accessing my account in particular. Several times he had inside knowledge of information that was contained in theory, only within my email and the recipients on those emails. And then two, important emails were showing up in my mailbox having already been marked as red. My questions here are, should I make a big deal about this? Or am I getting worked up over nothing? If it is a big deal, how do I go about documenting his access of my account and all the others? I'm hoping for log files that show him accessing my account, but I can't seem to find anything like that in the Exchange admin site. Thanks in advance. Wow, that is an awkward position to be in. And uh, my first thought is, if he doesn't have authorization to do this, and he is seeing HR inboxes and things of that nature, he could be seeing information he is not authorized to see and could be getting himself in a certain type of liable position. But uh, I think the first thing you need to do is turn on auditing of some kind on this mailbox so you can start monitoring when your mailbox gets accessed. That's the first thing that jumps out at me, and I'd audit everything you can, at least for a couple of weeks, and then go make sure you're checking those logs. Yeah, I think the important detail here is that it's not, you know, this isn't even just like, this isn't necessarily just bash history, is there anything else that's, that's solely technical? But email in many companies is the lifeblood of that company. That's where business transactions happen, that's where private HR interactions happens, that's where confidential emails between senior level staff happen that should not be leaked, or might even have consequences on the wider market if they are leaked. This does not seem authorized, and so you definitely need to get management involved. There, are, there, are, as you, as you say, Chris, there are definitely technical steps that that you can do to make sure you have enough data to build a case. But get someone trusted above you involved, and and see if there maybe someone's authorized this. But it really doesn't sound like it. Also, consider checking your domain controller's event viewer logs for authentication. Track down when it's happening, so maybe you can establish a pattern. Perhaps it's uh, somebody working late, things like that. So try to figure that out. Get some of this information in a row. And I would also consider alerting a management as fast as possible because now that you may be aware of this, you, you got to get all of your ducks in a row too. It's, it's now also on you to make sure that you're covering your track. So start taking notes of all of this stuff so that way you have a clear timeline and a record. That's a tough position to be in. It really is. And I think it's something we don't often talk about. There's sort of a... Um... I don't like the term, but old boys network of, of sysadmins and people that hold all the keys. And thankfully, generally, the community is pretty respectful of that. People acknowledge that when you do have that power for administration access, that you have to treat it responsibly. But that's, it's just not always the case, and it needs to be underscored. It's as much a cultural issue as it is technical. Yeah, if you have any suggestions, go ahead and send them into the show, techsnap.systems slash contact. And the next question that came in there is about setting up Active Directory. And this one resonated with me because I had clients that were in the 10 to 15 to 25 employee range, and they never bothered setting up Active Directory. They had a whole bunch of Windows desktops, though, and maybe like a couple of Macs here and there, maybe an NFS server, maybe for like, you know, a couple of project systems. But it was generally just local user accounts on all of the systems and maybe a couple file shares where people could access each other's hard drives. And it always would inevitably get to the point where some sort of centralized authentication was needed, some sort of centralized storage. So that's why this next question clicked with me, because boy, have I been here. He says, I'm currently managing a small company's IT department who have a dozen or so computers all using local login accounts on Windows 7 and Windows 10. There is no server operating system in the network, but instead one of the computers runs a network share, which other computers map to, and another share to map to a share for certain program databases. Red flag right there, massive recipe for um, uh, data loss. Uh, I did follow up with him, and he said he does have backups to go to the cloud, but I first thing there, I thought, boy, this is where FreeNAS could really come in. He says the company's expanding, but not hugely profitable, and they're trying to avoid licensing a bunch of Windows Server licenses and have been looking at potentially using Azure Active Directory instead of an on-site Windows Server. We'd like to have centralized logins, policies, and possibly some sort of deployment system. Is Active Directory Azure worth it when we have around 25 systems? This is a tough question to answer directly, I thought, because uh, Azure is going to be somewhere around the cost of $10 a head for every head, where you can get Windows Small Business Edition with 25 CALs for $500 once. 
Uh, or you could set up a Linux Samba box that is pretending to be a directory server and do it for free as long as you have the hardware. So I'm really torn on this one, Wes. If you are interested in more of an open source Linux based solution, which, hey, I guess I'm a little biased for it, go check out Free IPA. Linux has a ton of different solutions these days for LDAP, Kerberos, getting Samba tied in there. Free IPA makes it really simple to get started. They've great, great documentation. It can make it really easy to do. That's my personal technical preference, but I think as much as this is a technical question, again, it's kind of a business question. How much you want to pay, how much administrative overhead you have, and how many cycles the staff has for direct administration versus paying someone else to do it. Yeah, and if he's outsourced IT, he wants to build in a way that's sustainable for the company, even if they go with an internal person one day to do IT or a different company. And so maybe there's logic to just going all in on the Microsoft ecosystem. It's worth considering. You have free options. You could also, though, look at something like Microsoft 365 Business, which is around $20 per month per user. It's for businesses that have less than 300 employees. And it's not full Azure premium, but it does have user management capabilities. The workstations get joined to an Azure AD domain. You also get a terabyte of centralized storage, so you could also solve that kind of wonky share situation you have going on. And it includes Office, and it includes Exchange 50 gigs of email storage, and it includes mobile device management. So it's a decent deal for 20 bucks a month if you just want to go all in and you essentially remain serverless on site. I would be at least tempted to take a look at something like a FreeNAS server on location and you could even toss free IPA in a VM on FreeNAS or maybe just use some of the features built into FreeNAS itself. That is at least worth considering, but there are lots of options these days. Yeah, I think it's especially difficult because the business world is, is oftentimes very different than what you might do for personal use or, or even just like an even smaller business's use case. When you have, if you feel like you have cycles to maintain these things, if you're interested in doing that, if there are staff on hand and you think that it would benefit and provide additional flexibility that would be useful to the business, I say explore it. But if not, and if you have the funds, if the, you know, the, the financial officers in charge think that it's reasonable, sometimes instead of hiring staff, it makes more sense to just outsource things. And that's a call that is kind of particular to you. We had a cool tool sent into the show over at techsnap.system slash contact, Routersploit. We've been talking about VPN filter and banging on these home routers. Well, how about a little Routersploit, a framework that's open source, and it's designed to help you go after embedded devices like exploits, get credentials, scan them, and if you find a vulnerability, deliver a payload. You know, my favorite kind of tool, and we'll have a link to it in the show notes, it includes guides on how to get started on Kali Linux, uh, Ubuntu 18.04, 17.10, and on macOS and a Docker image. So pretty much going to be able to use it anywhere, and then you can go bang on those embedded devices. Routersploit. It's even modeled after Metasploit. So if you're already familiar with some of the command line uses of Metasploit, Routersploit is very similar. So you should be right at home. They've got some pretty good docs. They've got a bunch of those, of those you know, uh, default credentials that you were just talking about there, Chris. So this could be useful, you know, in a security research standpoint, certainly. But even if you just want to verify and check out some of your home networks or networks of friends and family, this is a great tool. And that brings us to the end of this week's TechSnap program. And I'm going to just give one more plug to that contact page because we love the feedback. We want lots of your emails at techsnap.systems slash contact. Yeah, absolutely. War stories, just questions you might have, or, you know, we love deep dives here on the TechSnap program. So if you have some ideas of, of topics you've been confused about, just haven't had enough time to go figure out all the all the messy details, let us know and we will be glad to take a look. Absolutely. And if you want more Wes Payne during the week, you can follow him on Twitter. He is at Wes Payne. I'm at Chris LIS, and the whole network is at Jupiter Signal. I'll still be on the road for about two more weeks. You can track me at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash rover. Never fear, dear audience. The TechSnap program will continue, maybe with a few delays or changes here or there. If you don't want to have to worry about any of that, just go to techsnap.systems slash subscribe. Thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of the TechSnap program, and we'll see you right back here next week. Next week.